The Cien Vu Ang movement was a large-scale Vietnamese insurgency between 1885 and 1889 against French colonial rule. Its objective was to expel the French and install the boy Emperor Ham Gi as the leader of an independent Vietnam. The movement lacked a coherent national structure, and consisted mainly of regional leaders who attacked French troops in their own provinces. The movement initially prospered, as there were only a few French garrisons in Annam, but failed after the French recovered from the surprise of the insurgency and poured troops into Annam from bases in Tonkin and Koch in China. The insurrection in Annam spread and flourished in 1886 reached its climax the following year and gradually faded out by 1889. French involvement in Vietnam 17th-18th century French involvement in Vietnam begins as early as the 17th century, with missionaries such as Alexandre de Rhodes spreading the Catholic faith. This situation was to remain until the late 18th century, when a popular uprising against heavy taxation and corruption, known as the Tay Son Uprising, toppled the ruling Nguyen family in 1776. A Nguyen prince, Nguyen Anh managed to escape. In an attempt to regain power, Nguyen Anh sought the assistance of France through French missionaries in Vietnam. Though he did not receive formal military assistance, he was supplied with sufficient aid by sympathetic merchants and was able to reclaim the throne. Although not officially sanctioned by the French government, this was to heighten French interest in Vietnam and mark the start of increased intervention. 19th century, the loss of the South. After regaining the throne in 1802 at the capital city of Hue in central Vietnam, Nguyen Anh re-established the Confucian traditions and institutes that were overturned during the Tay Sun uprising. Having returned to power with the aid of foreigners, this was in order to reassure the scholar gentry families that comprised much of the government and bureaucracy of a return to the system that guaranteed their privileges. While this helped to legitimize the returning Nguyen dynasty in the eyes of the mandarins and officials, it did little to assuage or address the grievances that sparked the Taesun uprising. As a result, the reign of the dynasty was marred by peasant resentment and constant revolts. Discontentment by the oppressed peasants, particularly among the lower classes, provided fertile grounds for Catholic missionaries, further widening the divide between the Nguyen dynasty and its subjects. The domestic situation would continue to worsen until the 1850s. This had critical implications for Vietnamese resistance to the coming French colonial aggression. It robbed Vietnam of a united front by setting the administration and the people against each other. The resulting mistrust and antagonism would discourage any attempt by the government to move the court out amongst the peasants in the advent of serious foreign incursions. A successful precedent set by previous dynasties. The peasantry would also be deprived of leadership and regional coordination traditionally provided by the royal court. In 1858, for ostensibly religious reasons, France took military action against Vietnam. French interest in Vietnam had not waned since Nguyen Nguyen's request for assistance. After the 1848 revolution, the French government now had sufficient support from commercial, religious and nationalistic sources to stage its conquest of Vietnam. A force led by Admiral Rigaud generally attacked and occupied the Vietnamese town of Da Nang. This was followed up with the capture of the Saigon in the Mekong Delta region in 18. 1959. However, Vietnamese reinforcements from nearby provinces soon put both French positions under siege. Despite the tenuous situation of the French, Vietnamese forces were unable to force the foreigners out of the country. This was due in large part to dissension within the royal court on the best approach to deal with the French. One party advocated armed resistance while the other argued for compromise. Most writers concede that the emperor
emperor and many high-ranking officials favored appeasing the French through a policy named Hoagy. Additionally, for reasons mentioned previously in the article, the dynasty was reluctant to arm or rely on the peasantry, relying instead on the royal troops which could only put up a feeble struggle. In 1861, the French had managed to consolidate their forces and break the Vietnamese army's siege of Saigon. To the surprise of the French forces, the defeat of the royal army did not put an end to Vietnamese resistance. Instead, it marked the decline of formal, government-led resistance and gave rise to localized popular resistance. Nonetheless, the widespread struggle by the Vietnamese people dealt the French many setbacks. A key development at this juncture was the transfer of the leadership role from the dynasty to local scholar gentries. Having witnessed the ineffectiveness of the regular Vietnamese army and the uncertain direction of the royal court, many decided to take matters into their own hands, organizing villages into armed bands and planning guerrilla raids on French forces. This was in direct contrast to the royal court's attempts to make peace. This had the added effect of convincing the French that the Hue court had lost control of its forces in the Mekong Delta region and thus offering. Any concessions was pointless. In 1862, the Nguyen dynasty signed the Treaty of Saigon. It agreed to surrender Saigon and three southern provinces to France which were to become known as Cochin China. Some authors point to the dynasty's need to put down rebellions in the north as a reason territories were ceded in the south. Regardless of the reason, the regular army was to withdraw from the surrendered provinces, leaving the popular resistance movement to the French. Trong Dinh was a striking example of a resistance leader. He first gained prominence and military position during the siege of Saigon and also for his military accomplishments immediately after the defeat feet of the Vietnamese army. Despite the order to withdraw, Dinh remained in the region at the behest of the subordinates and also for patriotic reasons, echoing the sentiments of fellow scholar gentries. However, the popular resistance lacked coordination across regions and also could not provide spiritual encouragement, tools that only the Nguyen dynasty had access to. Up to 1865, the Nguyen dynasty followed its policy of compromise and continued continued attempting to reclaim the three southern provinces through diplomacy. This was despite warnings by the French that they would seize the remaining three southern provinces if popular resistance which they referred to as bandits, was not stopped. In 1867, citing the above-mentioned reasons, the French took over the remaining three southern provinces. The loss of the South had a momentous effect on Vietnam. First it exposed the weaknesses of the dynasty's policy of compromise. The few remaining mandarins and scholar gentry in the region were left with two options, to flee the region permanently or to collaborate with the new overlords. For the people of the Delta who had no other option but to stay, the setback was to prove unsurmountable. Popular resistance quickly lost all morale and disbanded, with the peasants resigning themselves to non-violent Violent postures. At this stage, the Nguyen dynasty had lost all allegiance and respect from the Vietnamese in the South. 19th century, loss of the North. In 1873, the French, citing restrictions on shipping and led by Francis Garnier, easily captured the northern city of Hanoi, facing little or no organized resistance. Garnier was eventually killed with the aid of the Black Flag Army and the city returned as part of a treaty signed in 1874. However the Nguyen dynasty now faced a loss of support and allegiance from its subjects in the north, similar to what had transpired in the south. Following actions taken by predecessors, the Nguyen dynasty turned to China for aid. Unsurprisingly, the French took action first in order to avoid being boxed out of North Vietnam. In 1882, a French captain named Henry Riviere repeated Garnier's feat of taking Hanoi. Rather than preparing the military for increased French aggression, the military was instructed to remain out of sight of the French. Riviere was later 
killed by the Black Flag Army during a military action, however the dynasty continued sounding out France for new negotiations and sidelining mandarins who still advocated armed resistance. In 1883, the last of the great emperors of Vietnam died without an heir. His death resulted in internecine discord among the different factions in Hue. At the same time, having witnessed the reconquest of Hanoi by French forces under Riviere, northern Vietnamese became further disillusioned with the leadership and military effectiveness of the royal court in Hue. Discontentment was amplified by the continued reliance of the royal court on negotiation. Despite the willingness of local mandarins and people to take up armed resistance against the French, dispatches from French commanders confirmed this praise in court representatives for pacifying the Vietnamese around Hue. The final straw for many northern Vietnamese came when the French captured the city of Sun Tay in 1883 against the combined forces of the Vietnamese, Chinese and Black Flag armies. Subsequently, there were attacks by local Vietnamese in the north on French forces, some even led by former mandarins in direct defiance of the policy set by Hugh. Matters at the royal court of Hugh were equally chaotic. The next emperor, Duck Duck, was in power for barely three months before being deposed due to his unbecoming conduct. The following emperor, Hai Epo, assigned the Treaty of Hugh in 1883 after hearing French guns near the capital city. The harsh and derogatory terms of the treaty which subjected Vietnam to French control served to destroy any possible support Hai Epo had among the Vietnamese people and at court. He was quickly arrested and killed by the Mandarin Tun that Thuyet, who was fervently anti-French. Thuyet was also secretly drawing upon the economy to make guns for a secret fortress in Tan So. Tun that Thuyet had an associate, Nguyen Van Thuing, who was also considered a problematic Mandarin by the French. In 1884, the Emperor Ham Gi was enthroned as the Emperor of Vietnam. Only 12 years of age, he was easily and quickly dominated by the regents Thuyet and Thuyng. By now, the French had realized the obstacles the two mandarins posed and decided to remove them. Resistance continued growing while the French in Tonkin were distracted by the Sino-French War. Matters came to a head in June 1885, when France and China signed the Treaty of Shenzhen, in which China implicitly renounced its historic claims to suzerainty over Vietnam. Now freed from external distractions, the French government was determined to gain direct rule over Vietnam. Their agent of choice was General Count Roussel de Corsi. In May 1885, de Corsi arrived in Hanoi and took control of French military power in order to remove the Mandarins Thuyet and Thuyng. Most historians agree that de Corsi felt France's military might was enough to cow the Vietnamese and that he was a strong advocate of the use of force. However, there appears to be contention regarding the French government's endorsement, if any, of de Corsi's agenda. Regardless, General de Corsi and an escort of French troops of the Tonkin Expeditionary Corps went to Hue and attempted to incite problems. The Hue ambush, July 1885. Having arrived at Hue in July 1885, de Corsi summoned the princes and high mandarins of the royal court to his residence for a discussion on the presentation of his credentials to the emperor. During the discussion, he demanded that the central gate was to be open and that the emperor would have to come down from his throne to greet him. De Corsi also commented on Thuyet's absence from the meeting and suggested that this was due to Thuyet's planning an attack on him. After being told that Thuyet was sick, de Corsi's response was that he should have attended the meeting regardless and threatened to arrest him. 
Finally, the Corsi rejected the gifts sent by the emperor and demanded tribute from the Vietnamese. After the reception, Van Tuong met with Thurliet to discuss the events that had transpired during the discussion. Both Mandarins agreed that de Corsi's intention was to destroy them. Forced into a corner, they decided to stake their hopes on a surprise attack on the French. That very night, the French were attacked by thousands of Vietnamese insurgents during organized by the two Mandarins. De Corsi rallied his men, and both his own command and other groups of French troops cantoned on both sides of the citadel of Hue were able to beat off the attacks on their positions. Later, under the leadership of Chef de Bataillon Metzinger, the French mounted a successful counterattack from the west, fighting their way through the gardens of the citadel and capturing the royal palace. By daybreak the isolated French forces had linked up, and were in full control of the citadel. Angered by what they saw as Vietnamese treachery, they looted the royal palace. Following the failure of the Hu ambush, as it was immediately dubbed by the French, the young Vietnamese King Ham Gi and other members of the Vietnamese imperial family fled from Hu and took refuge in a mountainous military base in Tan So. The regent Tun Tht Thuyet, who had helped Ham Gi escape from Hu, persuaded Ham Gi to issue issue an edict calling for the people to rise up and aid the king. Thousands of Vietnamese patriots responded to this appeal in Annam itself, and it undoubtedly also strengthened indigenous resistance to French rule in neighboring Tonkin, much of which had been brought under French control during the Sino-French War. The Convu Ang Edict was undoubtedly a turning point in Vietnamese resistance to French rule. For the first time, the royal court had a common goal with the peasantry in the north and south, which stood in stark contrast to the bitter divisions between the royal court and its subjects which had hobbled resistance to the French to date. The flight of the emperor and his court to the countryside amongst the peasants had serious implications for both resistance and collaboration with the French. First, it brought moral and spiritual authority over to the resistance. Mandarins who chose to work with the French could no longer claim to work on behalf of the court. They had to acknowledge the realities of being tools of a foreign power. On the other hand, Mandarins who chose to fight the French even without traditional royal sanction would be greatly relieved to find their decisions vindicated. Next, the royal court's flight to the resistance brought about access to two key tools mentioned earlier, regional coordination coordination and spiritual encouragement. Witnessing the hardships endured by the emperor and his entourage allowed subjects to develop a newfound empathy for their emperor and increased hatred towards the French. The emperor could also promulgate edicts across the entire country, calling on subjects in every province and village to rise up and resist the French. Last but not least, the capital city of Hue and the dynasties it harbored had historically played an active role in struggles against Mongol and Chinese aggression. It was the source of leaders and patriotic imagery for the rest of the country. Its participation would link the current resistance movement to previously successful movements and also to future movements up to the modern era. The Convu Ang Edict, the emperor proclaims, from time immemorial there have been only three strategies for opposing the enemy, attack, defense, negotiation. Opportunities for attack were lacking. It was difficult to gather required strength for defense, and in negotiations the enemy demanded everything. In this situation of infinite trouble we have unwillingly been forced to resort to expedients. Was this not the example set by King Tai in leaving for the mountains of Qi and by Hsuan Sung when fleeing to Shu? Our country recently has faced many critical events. We came to the throne very young, but have been greatly concerned with self-strengthening and sovereign government. Nevertheless, with every passing day the Western envoys got more and more overbearing. Recently they brought in troops and naval reinforcements, trying to force 
dishonest conditions we could never accept. We received them with normal ceremony, but they refused to accept a single thing. People in the capital became very afraid that trouble was approaching. The high ministers sought ways to retain peace in the country and protect the court. It was decided, rather than bow heads in obedience, sitting around and losing chances, better to appreciate what the enemy was up to and move first. If this did not succeed, then we could still follow the present course to make better plans, acting according to the situation. Surely all those who share care and worry for events in our country already understand, having also gnashed their teeth, made their hair stand on end, swearing to wipe out every last bandit. Is there anyone not moved by such feelings? Are there not plenty of people who will use Lance's pillow, thump their oars against the side, grab the enemy's spears, or heave around water jugs? Court figures had best follow the righteous path, seeking to live and die for righteousness. Were not Ku Yuan and Chao Sui of Qin, Kuo Sui and Li Kuang Pai of Tianj men who lived by it in antiquity, our virtue being insufficient, amidst these events we did not have the strength to hold out and allow the royal capital to fall, forcing the empresses to flee for their lives. The fault is ours entirely, a matter of great shame but traditional loyalties are strong. Hundreds of mandarins and commanders of all levels, perhaps not having the heart to abandon me, unite as never before. Those with intellect helping to plan, those with strength willing to fight, those with riches contributing for supplies, all of one mind and body in seeking a way out of danger, a solution to all difficulties. With luck, heaven will also treat man with kindness, turning chaos into order, danger into peace, and helping thus to restore our land and our frontiers. Is not this opportunity fortunate for our country, meaning fortunate for the people, since all who worry and work together will certainly reach peace and happiness together? On the other hand, those who fear death more than they love their king, who put concerns of household above concerns of country, mandarins who find excuses to be far away, soldiers who desert, citizens who do not fulfill public duties eagerly for a righteous cause, officers who take the easy way and leave brightness for darkness, all may continue to live in this world, but they will be like animals disguised in clothes and hats. Who can accept such behavior? With rewards generous, punishments will also be severe. The court retains normal usages, so that repentance should not be postponed. All should follow this edict strictly. By imperial order second day, sixth month, first year of Hamgi, 